Hey guys, my name is Joanna and I have partnered up with the Flute Center of New York to bring you guys monthly flute review videos. Before we jump into this review, I need to let you guys know about a couple of perks. If you use my code JAF when you purchase a flute from the Flute Center of New York, you will get one, free domestic shipping within the US, two, an extended 10 day trial, usually it's only seven days, three, an extended 18 month warranty on your new flute, and four, you will be able to take up to three instruments out for a trial at a time. To be 100% transparent, I do earn a small commission on each flute that is purchased using my code through the Flute Center of New York. If you want to take flutes out on trial, head on over to the Flute Center of New York's contact page. I will link it in the bottom bar below. All you do is email or call them, give them my code JAF, and they will walk you through the rest of the process. Or if you already know which flute you're going to order, simply go to the Flute Center of New York's website and at checkout, use my code JAF as the coupon code. Just be sure that you are actually in the market to buy a flute when you take flutes out on trial because if you're not actually in the market to buy it, then that helps no one. The Flute Center of New York also price matches any other authorized flute dealers, so you always know you're getting the best bang for your buck. All right, and now just a few things about trying flutes. Make sure you take off all rings and dangly jewelry that can potentially scratch the flute. Never use the polishing cloth, the swabbing cloth, or the cleaning rod that comes with each new flute because they are not yours yet. If you do that, the Flute Center of New York actually has to replace them. And lastly, a quick disclaimer, every flutist plays each flute differently. Like in Harry Potter, just as the wand chooses the wizard, so the flute chooses the flutist. I'm just here to describe to you guys to the best of my ability how each of these flutes that I try like to be played. All right, and with all that said and done, let's jump right into the review. Today we'll be reviewing the Pearl 505 model and the Pearl 665 model. I'm just going to read straight off of the invoice that the Flute Center of New York sent to me regarding these flutes. For the Pearl 505, all silver plated, open hole, offset G, split E mechanism, B foot joint. And now we have the Pearl 665, sterling silver head joint, silver plated body, foot joint, and mechanism, offset G, split E mechanism, French open hole, B foot joint. So the one big difference between these two flutes is that the 665 has an all sterling silver head joint rather than a silver plated head joint that the 505 has. As you can see, we have our traditional French case and cover. Even the inside is like this kind of like fleece lining. Very typical. The shoulder strap is already attached onto the cover itself. Typically when shoulder straps are included with the case, they usually are detachable and they're usually placed in the zipper compartment in here when you first get it. If you know anything about sewing, you will notice that the strap is not only sewn on to the side, but you can see it's actually tucked in and it's actually sewn into the actual case itself. You very much know that the shoulder strap is not going to give. Inside you get your typical polishing cloth and then you get a really lovely dark wood cleaning rod. And they also give you a swabbing cloth. It's actually a gauze. Now, the interesting thing that they have here is an owner's manual in several languages. They have not only instructions, but they have diagrams, like they have actual pictures of a real person putting the flute together, dismantling the flute and cleaning the flute. There's even a part here that shows you how to check the position of what they call the reflection plate, basically the placement of the cork. That's not something that I typically see in something like this. First off, I don't even normally see owner's manuals. I think the last owner's manual I saw was in a Yamaha flute. It also has a description of parts, embouchure hole, embouchure plate, head joint, middle joint, cup, key, washer, pad. So it like even tells you about the key itself, how all the keys are constructed, foot joint, rod, key section, etc. I think it's fantastic that they include an owner's manual, especially because these flutes that I'm looking at this time, they are more for students. Then when you open up the case itself, you'll notice that the inside is lined with this really beautiful green velvety lining. I don't typically see green used inside a case, so I thought it was really, really nice. I mean, it could also have something to do with the fact that I'm Slytherin and I like those colors. They include a giant silver tarnish strip. So this is called Silver Saver. I don't particularly think I've ever seen one this huge before. I like that they have actually cut it to size so that it fits right into the lid of the case. Now the thing that I have never seen before on a new flute are these plastic caps 
that they put on the thinnest parts of the flute. These are the parts of the joints that fit into another piece. So they're the inside piece. The inside piece tends to be the thinnest. I know this from experience. When I first got my professional model flute, the first dent that I made in it was here in this joint. To be honest, you never see this on a professional model flute. In a way, I kind of wish that some professional model flutes had this because, you know, it would make life easy for a lot of us who are slightly on the clumsy side. All right, so now let's try the Pearl 505. Blowing into this flute has two parts to it. The first part is the shape of your air stream inside of your mouth. Yes, I understand that the air is actually coming from your lungs and coming out this way, but in terms of how you imagine the air being shaped in your mouth, on this flute, I imagined it being shaped as a tube. First off, you kind of want to imagine that this tube is about the size of like a lipstick and that lipstick is in your mouth and that is the shape of the air that is flowing through your mouth and out of your mouth. So one end of the lipstick tube is right in the hollow right behind your bottom front teeth. Now the other end of the tube is just tilted slightly up, maybe two thirds up in your mouth. So the back end of that lipstick tube does not touch the roof of your mouth. It's actually a little bit lower than that. Now, depending on your own personal mouth formation, it may be placed a little bit higher than what I'm describing or a little bit lower than what I'm describing. But generally the feeling is that it's tilted like this so that the back end is a little bit higher than the front. Keeping this shape in mind, the lower you play, the longer that lipstick tube is, but it doesn't go so far back that you swallow it. So it's only going at maybe two thirds way into your mouth. Now, the higher you go, the more you shorten that tube and the highest notes make you feel like that lipstick tube is only about the size of a marble that's just sitting in the hollow behind your front bottom teeth. Part two of breathing into this flute I find requires you to have a constant feeling of rushing air between your lips. It is a very aggressive style of playing. Now, because you have all of this crazy rushing air right between your lips, you have to make sure you do not smash the flute into your chin. If you do end up smashing the flute into your chin, you will actually decrease the amount of space there is between your lips to have that feeling of rushing air. I find that if I'm not conscious enough to create this feeling of rushing air between my lips, I lose a lot of the resonance in the tone. But if I remember, the tone of this flute just comes alive. I also played around with the gizmo on this flute. On this particular flute, the gizmo does correct not only the pitch, so it flattens it a little bit on the high C, but it also made the high C come out a lot more easily. So the gizmo is very, very important on this particular flute. And now for harmonics. If you follow the type of playing that I just described to you with the tube and with the constant rushing air, if you naturally play like that, the harmonics are just gonna come out really easily for you. You won't even have to think about it. I do notice that there's wonderful, wonderful resonance in the lower harmonics. So we're looking at the second, third, fourth harmonics. The higher harmonics, you lose a little bit of the resonance, but they still come out really easily. All right, and now for tone color.
So going back to this lipstick tube I was talking about, generally you want to widen that shape for a richer tone and you want to narrow it down for a more hollow tone. However, even when you are playing with a hollow tone, this flute does still require you to keep that feeling of constant rushing air between your lips. So this of course means that you have to allow for a little bit of extra room for that to even happen, which means that you end up narrowing down the back half of that lipstick tube more so it actually becomes a little bit more of a cone shape when you are playing with a hollow tone. If you keep that in mind, you won't lose the resonance in your tone. All right, and now for the mechanism. <laughs> I find that the mechanism on this flute is springy with a little bit of resistance. So this will be very good for more heavy handed players. This springiness with a little bit of resistance also applies to all of its trill keys. The low C trill, the high C trill. And even the B flat lever. They all have a little bit more resistance than many other flutes. It's only a tiny bit though. Like you only really notice it if you're looking for it. Now for articulation. On this flute, I ended up doing what I call a pseudo French tongue. So for those of you who don't know what French tonguing is, it's a very forward type of tonguing. So your tongue comes all the way out from between your teeth or even as far out as from between your lips. So you end up doing something like or now because this flute requires you to have that constant feel of rushing air between your lips, I noticed that I naturally ended up doing this more forward tonguing. I noticed, however, that my tongue stayed a little higher up than a traditional French tonguing. So primarily the tip of my tongue hit the bottom of my top front teeth, but I don't really feel it against my bottom front teeth. And when I'm double tonguing on this flute, I find that I have to imagine the K being hit in the middle of the roof of my mouth. So that's actually quite far up for a K sound because if you just think k, k, you notice that your tongue is making that sound quite far back in your mouth. But because this flute has such forward playing, I found that if I let my K go too far back, it ended up swallowing my sound. Basically, we are keeping that K part of the double tongue up and out of the way of that lipstick tube of air. And lastly for this flute, dynamics. The movement inside of your mouth is very similar to when you're playing with tone color. The tube widens like crazy for super loud playing. And that cone shape that I was describing for a hollow tone is even tinier even further forward in your mouth for super soft playing. You basically feel like that cone shape for super soft playing is like right at the edge of your lips. Like that's how far forward it is. You also need quite aggressive lipping to correct the pitch when you are playing with dynamics. The louder you go, the more you're stuffing air into the flute, which means that you run the risk of playing sharp. So in that case, you have to lip down. And when you're playing soft, you're not putting as much air in, which means that you run the risk of going quite flat. So I found that on this flute, I had to do very, very aggressive lipping up to correct the pitch. And now let's look at the Pearl 665 model. Now, before we jump straight into noodling on this flute, I wanted to point out something very interesting about this lip plate. There is a sharp drop off opposite of where your lips are blowing into the flute. You will hear very soon that this flute is a lot more free blowing. And I wonder if this sharp drop off contributes to this flute's more forgiving nature when it comes to blowing into this flute. All right, now let's get into noodling. So this flute 
flute also requires that same kind of two-part blowing into the flute. However, on the 665, that feeling of constant rushing air is placed a little bit further back. So whereas on the 505, that feeling was right between your lips, on the 665, it's pretty much between your teeth. That lipstick tube shape is also a little wider than on the 505. And therefore it doesn't feel as constricting as on the 505. I did feel that on the 505, it was very particular about exactly how you need to blow into the flute. This tube of air being a little wider also allows you to simply put more air into the flute. So I do notice that playing this flute just naturally gives you a richer tone. Now that also can be because the head joint itself is made from sterling silver. It's not silver plated. So the sterling silver in the head joint will actually give you a lot more richness, fullness, resonance in your tone than if the head joint was silver plated. I also played with the gizmo on the 665. I noticed that it doesn't actually help much with ease of playing because it is already super responsive in the highest register. But I do notice that it does help correct the pitch a little bit, not quite as much as the 505. So the gizmo does help, but it doesn't play as huge of a role as on the 505. All right, and now for harmonics. a much less constricted way of playing on this flute than on the 505, the seventh harmonic is a lot easier to get out. Fun fact, I actually got that seventh harmonic out by accident the first time I did it. I was actually aiming for the sixth harmonic and I just accidentally cracked up to the seventh harmonic, which normally doesn't happen because it should take a lot more air, a lot more support than the sixth harmonic. I did notice that on this flute, you don't lose your resonance as you continue going higher in the harmonics. It naturally just stays there. Very impressive. And now for tone color. Same idea, widen up that lipstick tube for a richer tone, narrow it down for a more hollow tone. On this flute, you don't have to worry so much about that cone shape that I was talking about. That feeling of constant rushing air is now between your teeth instead of between your lips. So you actually have more room to work with and therefore you don't have to worry so much about that cone shape. It feels like a tube, it doesn't feel like a cone. I also feel like I have more control over just how hollow I can go on the 665. I feel like not only am I narrowing down that lipstick tube, I'm actually like squashing it. So if you think of it like a straw and you squash the sides of a straw, it will push the top and the bottom part of the straw up and down, right? Like it'll pucker up and down. It actually helps you make the tone even more hollow. I like the fact that I can have a few more varying degrees of hollowness on the 665 than I can on the 505. Same goes for widening the tube to create a richer tone. I find that I have a little bit more control over just how wide I can go and how rich I can go. And I have more degrees of richness that I can play with. All right, and now for the mechanism. So as you probably guessed, the mechanism is the exact same as on the 505. So you have that same springiness with a little bit of resistance. And that is also the case for the trill keys and the B flat lever. All right, and now for articulation. feeling of constant rushing air is further back in your mouth, I find that it also pushes your tongue further back into your mouth. I found that my tongue was touching the roof of my mouth where it meets my front teeth. So it follows that the K part of your double tongue 
also moves back a little bit, but again, you run the risk of swallowing your sound. So I found that I ended up still imagining that K hitting the middle of the roof of my mouth, but even lighter than on the 505. I found that I had to be a little bit more careful about my double tonguing on the 665. All right, and lastly, dynamics. Again, similar to the 505, but much more forgiving. When you play softly, you narrow down and shrink that lipstick tube into a super tiny tube. But on the 665, it's placed further back in your mouth than on the 505. Similar idea for super loud playing. You can widen that lipstick tube like crazy and really pour air into the flute. I do find that on the 665, you still need to use some lipping to correct the pitch of both soft playing and loud playing, but it's not as aggressive as on the 505. All right, and there you have it. That was my review of the Pearl 505 and 665. Let's now look at how much they cost. So the setup that I have here in this review for the Pearl 505 costs $763.75. Now for the Pearl 665, the particular setup that I have going on here is $1,200. $2.50. So yes, that silver head joint does bump it up quite a bit. But as you can see from this review, just that head joint alone really bumps up the level of the entire flute. So that is it for this review. If you guys have suggestions for future reviews, please let us know in the comment section below. Not only do I read them, but the Flute Center of New York also reads your comments. Be sure to follow the Flute Center of New York on their Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I will put all of that in the bottom bar below. And if you guys like this video, make sure you give me a big thumbs up and hit subscribe for new videos every Saturday. My last video is over there. And if you want to catch me during the week, my social media networks are down there. But otherwise, I will see you guys next week. Bye.